Hello again. The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of the animal industry and conservation. It aims to provide the truthful, scientific and educational information wildlife biologists need to get ahead of the competition. Each video is an interview with a conservationist. Each fortnight, scientists give their ideas for animal projects, tips for what to wear at a job interview, and good questions to ask at an interview. Today's guest is an expert on fishing cats. Zafir Ahmed Sheikh is founder of Fishing Cat Conservation in Pakistan. Prepare to learn more about one of the world's most remarkable small cats, one that likes water. If you enjoy the video, please consider subscribing. I began by asking Zafir what his best fishing cat fact is. You'll never believe the answer. According to scientists, fishing cats first appeared in the fossil record between 4.31 and 1.74 million years ago. Zafir, what's your best <laughs> yeah. fishing cat fact, please? All right. So uh, there's quite a few. There's quite a few, but my personal favorite, and I'd say it's kind of synonymous across the fishing cat community. It's uh, the fact that fishing cats have semi-retractable claws. Uh, it's unlike the big cat, uh, big cat cousins. The lions and cheetahs have uh, fully retractable claws. So the, the difference is that for fishing cats, they have a well. Uh, they have a semi-aquatic lifestyle. They are very close to wetlands. Their habitat is the wetlands, swamps, marshes, and you know mangroves, so to speak. So, in that habitat type and in that ecosystem, most of the food that's around water, I mean, you'd, you'd guess it. It's it, it would be slippery, and it's hard to get to. So, for an animal like this to survive and to just you know just latch on to the prey, they have semi-retractable claws that help them you know just you know, just grab better onto the prey so that's 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 my favorite fact for the species that's and brilliant. yeah just that's brilliant yeah, that, that just gives, gives them yeah that just gives them uh, a lot of uh i'd say control even when they're uh swimming can you complete this sentence please fishing cats oh, yeah. are i'd say fishing cats are flagship species for wetlands marshlands ecosystem uh sorry swamps, mangroves, and, you know, the diversity of uh, habitats they occur in. So I would say they definitely act as a flagship species for, especially for countries like Pakistan, uh, at least in the south and the plain region. Uh, I don't know how many people know, but uh, we have lost the tiger, we lost the lion, and we also lost the cheetah. So we do not have a whole lot of large uh, carnivores or, you know, iconic species, you know, to work with. So in, in places like this, in places like this where uh, fishing cats still occur, they're still, you know, clinging on. So they can be really, you know, put forward as flagship flagship species because they represent a really important ecosystem that's still worth protecting. Hmm. So, yeah, that's, that's I'd say, yeah, fishing cats definitely are a flagship species for multiple habitat types. Hmm. I think that's probably the best answer I've had for in any of these interviews, actually. That's great. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Zafir, what does your work with fishing cats involve, please? It mainly revolves around threat mitigation. Threat mitigation, uh, threats do vary region to region. Obviously, Pakistan is, is at the westernmost range of the limit of the fishing cat distribution. And the easternmost range ends up in Indonesia, but it's doubtful occurrence right now. So along the global distribution, there's multiple threats. But for Pakistan specifically, I'd say, the biggest threat is the fish farm conflict. So uh, fish farm conflict and the poultry retaliation case. So the big thing is uh, cats 
find easy prey, right? So easy prey is available in the form of fish in fish farms, you know, just artificial fish farms and people who have poultry just out there in the open. So Pakistan being a very underdeveloped country, we have, you know, all sorts of factors playing into like extreme poverty, you know, and just uh, weak infrastructure and everything, you know, just all, all kind of aspect that plays into it. So that's why in terms of the fish farm conflict, the fish farms are just out in the open. There's no uh, boundary or there's no proper barrier for entry for species like fishing guides. So what they do is fishing guides just easily just find all sorts of prey species in the fish farm. And for fish farmers, that's economic loss. They're, uh, that's economic loss right there and then. And they have, I don't want to say a valid reason, but they have a reason to retaliate. So what they do is uh, we have had multiple cases of them shooting fishing cats at night. And that's actually one of the main reasons I found upon, I came upon a record of a cat being shot at night. And that's what, that's how I found out the cats were still occurring in Pakistan because the general consensus up to like three years ago that was that the cat is extinct in the country among the conservationists and researchers. So that's how we came across it and that's how we started working. So for fish farm conflict, what we do is we provide awareness but awareness can only go a long way. So what we can do is, uh, what we do is we provide and, you know, we just provision them with fish seedlings. It's just, you know, baby fish. And, you know, it's, it doesn't cost a lot, but it's a, if, if the, if the fishing cat takes a fish, that's like four, four or five kilos, we just provide, let's say a hundred fish seedlings. That's, it's not the same thing, but it's, I mean, the fish farmers are happy, you know, it's one part of it, but the, but the scale of the conflict is huge. It's, just, it's massive in the country. Uh, then again, it varies across countries. So another thing is with poultry owners. So a lot of, a lot of uh, rural communities who are very, very, uh, I'd say, I'd say, under the poverty line even. So they're just yet. Yeah. Uh, so poultry for them is a main source of earning and income. And if an animal that finds. Uh, poultry out in the open at night or even during the day, they prey on it. It's, it's easy food. And that leads to a whole lot of retaliation cases again, but that's not restricted to just fishing cats. It's, the fish farm conflict is mainly restricted to fishing cats and you know smooth-coated otters. Uh, but for the poultry retaliation case, it's not often fishing cats in general. For poultry farms or poultry uh, chicken coops, like very, be very basic and beet chicken coops that are just made out of, I'd say acacia and just bushes. Uh, it's very easy for a predator to get into and do a whole lot of damage. So for those, um, I'd say coops being placed near wetlands, fishing cats do do the damage. But if it's kind of away from the wetlands, it's at the other species that's usually sympatric with fishing cats. I, I don't know if you're aware of it. It's just jungle cat. So yeah. So then jungle cats, and then there's more species, the golden jackal, the small Indian civet. So it's a whole lot of species that that do the damage. And uh, a lot of the blame goes to you know, just one singular species. So it's, but yeah, I mean, of course, and again, if you're working on fishing cats or jungle cats, I mean, you can't just, you know, uh, tell them that it's golden jackals. I mean, that's not our work. You know, you can't just ignore that. So what we do is we just build chicken coops and it's, it's as basic as it sounds. Yeah it's uh what you do is you provide proper uh chicken coop structures and that can they're large enough so the benefit is multiple houses can put their chicken their property so to speak inside the chicken coops and it's safe so the predators don't get to the food and the the people the villages do not have a reason to retaliate so that's that's a that's a really easy and that's a doable solution that works most of the time that's just perfect. So uh, another thing that we are working with is uh, that we just started working with is road signs. So along along all of rural Pakistan, you know, you're going through uh, roads that are cutting through forests, and you know, well, we hardly have any forest left. I'd say scrub forests and you know, farmlands. There's a lot of road kills, specifically with jungle cats and fishing cats. It's I mean, sympatric species. So what we are starting to do is we're trying to create road signs, and it's a really fun thing because it. It's more of an awareness thing than people listen to uh, in terms of slowing, slowing down cars. That's something we want to work on. 
uh, people really get interested because, I mean, it's a really big thing in the Western world. You know, you see deer crossings or you see moose crossings, but you don't see stuff like that down here uh, in Pakistan. So that's that's something we're working on. And another thing is uh, we work with awareness programs and we're right now trying to get the local native wildlife information uh, kind of infused in the local school curriculum. So we're working on translating books. Uh, we have had some excellent books, books from uh, India and Nepal from our colleagues. And yeah, we were trying to just translate them into local languages and Sindhi and Urdu. And I mean, English does work as well. But I mean, if you're trying to get the message across to the communities who are directly, you know, in contact with the species, it's it's not going to be English. What jobs are there, if any, with All right. cats? The job market is growing. It's mainly in terms of ecologists, habitat management. And then it's also growing into, I'd say, research scientists. Yeah, research is growing, conservation, threat mitigation. Threat mitigation programs do get a lot of tension, I'd say, in the current global standards. Zafir, how would you describe uh, fishing cat conservation today? I mean, uh, what is their natural range? Uh, is the population stable, decreasing, increasing? Mm -hmm. All right. So. A basic answer would be the population for the population and for the range, it's in the negative. It's not looking good. Uh, I'd say for Pakistan, uh, I can tell we used to have fishing cats mainly centered around the riverine forest that used to be, you know, just massive and washed and spread all across the country. But now there's none. There's hardly the forest rate in the whole of the country is less than 3%. So there you go. Uh, in terms of habitat loss, there's it's everywhere from from Pakistan all the way to Cambodia and Vietnam and in Indonesia. So there's hardly patches of uh, good habitat left, but there's strong uh, conservation efforts on the side as well. But in terms of population, I'd say I can tell for Pakistan, it's definitely in the negative. It's definitely going down and the conservation efforts and the loss, the loss definitely outweighs the conservation efforts by a huge margin. And even, even globally, I'd say, even globally, we need a lot of work still for the populations and it's declining, yeah. How do you see the conservation work progressing well into the 21st century, Zafir? I'd say it's definitely growing and we're seeing a lot of different people from different different backgrounds, not just the conservation community. We are having, uh, especially for Pakistan, I'm saying, we are having companies interested, you know, CSR projects and uh, carbon credit companies interested in fishing cat conservation, which is a new thing, which is really positive. But at the same time, we are facing a lot of uh, threats that are ever increasing, population, uh, global human population increase especially in South Asian countries and Southeast Asian, it's it's massive. So that's something we are facing on. Another thing is the overlap, well, the uh, hidden effects of climate change. We do not exactly know how much damage it is doing currently to the species and its range in most of the places. The general interest is growing globally and it has definitely grown over the last five to 10 years, it has, but there's still a lot more to be done. Fishing cats do, fishing cats do adapt to a certain level in terms of habitat, but you can't expect them, you can't just wipe out the habitat and expect them to, you know, just still survive. Zafir, what skills are needed to work with fishing cats? Okay, so I did, I would divide that into three things. So the first, first is a generalistic idea of, you know, just having basic biology, ecology, you know, skills and, you know, you know how to, work with work with general wildlife and how to reduce threats threats and threat mitigation programs which is the big which is a big success uh secondly i'd say you need to be well aware of the habitat uh, for the species i mean you need you need to be custom to wetland ecosystems you need to know how they work you need to know how how they can transform to a certain level how they can adapt how you have to let them try thrive so that's something that's something. And second, uh, th third, and the last last most important thing I'd say for fishing cats, and I mean, it goes for most wildlife in general. And 
the most important one for me personally is communication skills. You know, you have to get the message across and you have to understand and you have to sympathize, sympathize with people who are there and who are, you know, these communities, these are really weak communities in terms of socioeconomic status and you have to work with them. Uh, here's the thing, you know, I'm, I'm a big city person. I'm from Karachi. So I can't just go uh, to the rural areas and just tell them, you know, you don't have to do this. You, you can't do that. And even if it's against the law, even if it's against the law, you know, they are aware of it or they may not be aware of it. They will not like it. You know, do you take on volunteers? No is the answer for now. Uh, two volunteers joining the fishing cap project mm. in Pakistan. What sort of skills must they must they see as being a, a massive advantage? Analyzation of data. Don't be uh, just all lab work. I mean, at the same time, you have to be out on the field. You know, you need to know uh, which threat mitigation approaches work the best. You need to analyze uh, which threat mitigation pro uh, procedures or approaches are successful, which aren't, which could do better. Habitat fragmentation. Specialization is good, but if you if you can just uh, diversify. Where do our knowledge gaps lie uh, regarding mm. the conservation ecology of fishing cats? But the knowledge gaps, yeah, I'd say distribution, behavioral ecology, genetics, threat mitigation, and you know, threat mi metrics go on to threat mitigation. So, yeah. Could you suggest uh, a good uh, research topic, please, for students in their final year of a biology degree? Impact of habitat fragmentation of fishing cat populations. That's a, it's a really good one. And secondly, I'd say community-based approaches to mitigating human wildlife conflict when it comes to fishing cats. Zafir, can you offer any advice for somebody who would like to have a career in fishing cat conservation? Keep at it. Work with the community. You know, have the community at your side. I mean, you can never, you know, go, you know, just cross them. You know, you always need to have the community by your side and you know, just yeah, work work with the local community. It just goes a long way for fishing cats and any other wildlife in general. Zafir, you are the founder of Fishing Cat Conservation in Pakistan. Thank you yeah. very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Zafir Sheikh. I'm I'm honored. I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was just a really good time answering all these questions.